putting on. And I would like to welcome everyone to the start of the BCCN PhD lecture series uh, in 2020. And um, it's a great honor for me to speak here. Uh, I have worked with a lot of students from the BCCN, uh, especially in the recent years. And it's always been a pleasure. And uh, of course, these lecture series also provide me with an opportunity to, um, first of all, give back and um, show what the, these BCCN students have worked on with me. And on the other hand, provides an uh, opportunity to promote our research and give insight into the questions and problems that we have in our field. And maybe you can um, think about for yourself what you find interested, interesting and how you may improve such research. I'm a medical doctor. My name is Julian Neumann. I'm an assistant professor for interventional and cognitive neuromodulation in the Department of Neurology. I'm working clinically in the Department of Neuroradiology, uh, so mainly brain, uh, structural brain uh, scanning and imaging. And um, I've been appointed uh, only two months ago in February and currently start my own group. And I'm going to speak today about computational advances in translation and neuroscience for clinical brain computer interfaces. And since I'm from the movement disorders and neuromodulation unit, uh, we will look at this from a perspective of deep brain stimulation and uh, deep brain stimulation I will uh, uh, try to convince you is a unique platform for research on network um, specific functions of the human brain. And I'm going to start uh, with this molecule for though many of you uh, will know it. Uh, it's the uh, structural formula for dopamine. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter that gives us uh, a lot of questions and a lot of things to work with trying to figure out what it does. And a lot of people probably know dopamine best as a motivational factor or something that is related to uh, uh, drug seeking behavior or craving, but it has a lot of very much more basic functions. And I'm going to start with uh, uh, with a few videos, and I hope they work um, on how loss of dopamine can affect the human brain and human behavior. And I'm going to start with sh by showing a few videos on a patient series that showed up in the San Francisco or Bay Area in the 1980s uh, in the emergency departments. And um, you can see this, uh, this patient, he developed uh, difficulties in moving over a very rapid time course. So only a few days and he came to the uh, emergency department and said, I cannot move anymore, what is wrong with me? And you can see that his, uh, his gait is affected and his um, face doesn't really uh, follow or make any movements. This is another patient from the same series, same time in the 1980s in uh, California. You can see uh, this patient is barely moving at all. So uh, you can see how her face lost any um, expression and how her arms are just lying still without any movement. And you can see a phenomenon here that a, a neurologist is checking, we call it rigidity. So uh, there's a stiffness of the muscles in these patients and they have difficulties initiating gait. They have a very small uh, um, step size and they also have difficulties in um, starting the gait cycle. So we, we have to remind ourselves that this ha happened over the course of days. And uh, these patients did not know what was going on. They just went to the emergency department. And when we look at this as a clinician or even a medical student, most of the medical students, I would say, who train uh, will recognize these symptoms or this neurological syndrome as a Parkinsonian syndrome. So these patients definitely don't have Parkinson's disease because Parkinson's disease is a slow progressing neuro neurodegenerative disease. 
um, most of the times or in the majority of the times. And um, these subjects develop this, these symptoms over days. And what is also odd is that these uh, subjects clustered geographically to a certain area in California at, in a certain time. And um, as I mentioned in the introduction, the, the problem these patients have is uh, a problem of production of dopamine. And the pathological sections of these patients later showed that um, similar to Parkinson's disease, where in this comp past compactor of the substantia nigra, which is uh, shown in the healthy condition in the uh, anatomical slice here on the left, there is a loss of these neurons in Parkinson's disease, but also in the condition that we saw in the few videos. And this is a very interesting story because first of all, uh, it's, it's a unique um, time where kind of drug use came to, uh, uh, came to a clinical phenomenon that is really well defined. And it was shown that, uh, in this case, it was shown that street-produced heroin had uh, uh, side effects through an uh, uh, unclean component that specifically destroys dopaminergic neurons. And all these subjects that I showed you, and uh, many more in, during that time, used the same street-produced heroin which led to a loss of, of the, uh, dopaminergic neurons in their past compactor of the substantia nigra. And so we learned that we, there is a component called MPTP, 1-methylphenyltetrahydropyridine, a side product of synthetic heroin production that is a selective neurotoxin for dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra. So while this was a tragic case series and uh, 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 loss for, this, for the uh, users, and um, these uh, users had a, a se severe um, side effects from the, from the drug that they used, it also gained a very unique insight into a neurotoxin that is selective for a certain um, group of neuro neurons in the brain. And this has led to many, many important um, discoveries later on, because it allowed to understand and give insight into the circuit of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia represent a set of nuclei that are subcortically central in the brain and comprise the putamen the pallidum with the external and the internal um, part and the subdynamic nucleus. And it could sh be shown that loss of dopaminergic neurons leads to a dramatic increase of subdynamic activity. And this could be shown by using MPTP that was identified through these cases uh, in experiments involving non-human primates and non-human primates were exposed with this neurotoxin, and this led to a Parkinsonian syndrome, and therefore uh, to an animal model of Parkinson's disease that could be studied to understand the underlying circuitry. And now we know a lot of complicated and complex interactions that uh, evolve from cortex through striatum, basal ganglia, to the thalamus that are associated with the Parkinsonian state and the hypodopaminergic state. And ultimately, the identification of MPTP from these drug users led to a new treatment for Parkinson's disease. By, uh, and this is a landmark paper published in 1990 by uh, Hagai Bergman in Science, where they showed that um, monkeys rendered Parkinsonian by treatment with MPTP could be, um, uh, could be treated or uh, could get as therapy through lesioning some of the, uh, the subcortical nuclei. And um, this led to a loss of excessive activity in the subdynamic nucleus, which is this part here, STN, 
and uh, could lead to a symptoms alleviation of the Parkinsonian symptoms. So again, monkeys were treated with MPTP. Then it was shown that they got Parkinsonian symptoms, and then lesioning some of the basal ganglia nuclei, particularly the subthalamic nucleus, led to a uh, to a reversal of these symptoms, and this paved the way for a new treatment avenue, which is um, first the stereotactic lesion of subtal or subthalamotomy in humans, and later this led to the development of subthalamic deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. Subthalamic deep brain stimulation is a very effective treatment today, which has been replicated in numerous high, uh, uh, highly cited multicentric uh, randomized controlled trials with a very strong positive effect on the symptoms of, is particularly on the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And here you can see the basic pattern or uh, the basic approach. Uh, uh, a lead is implanted into the depths of the brain, into the subdynamic nucleus from uh, outside. So there will be a, a a neurosurgeon creates a burr hole, implants the DBS leads, and connects these DBS leads to an extension wire that connects to an IPG or impulse generator that is uh, implanted either in the abdominal wall or in the chest of the patient. Now, then uh, the stimulation is switched on and it's uh, set to a high frequency of pulses, so 130 pulses per second. And um, after that, it will be switched on for the entire time. And this allows us to understand the modulation of neural activity through uh, invasive um, alteration with, these, with this stimulation paradigm. And it's a uh, unique research platform to investigate the functional and pathophysiological roles of basal ganglia in patients with Parkinson's disease. Now, to give you an impression of this effect, on the left side, you can see a Parkinsonian patient from our clinic who is uh, in, the, in the medication off state. That means that he did not take any dopaminergic agents. And you can see all the hallmarks of Parkinson's disease. He has a little bit of tremor, but mainly the main symptom is bradykinesia, which is, translates into slowness of movement. And he has a small step size. His arms are not moving while, or swinging while he's moving. He has an increased turning step amount. And he has also some forward bending of his trunk, which is called camptochromia. And these are the major hallmarks of Parkinson's disease. And again, in the video, following off dopaminergic medication, but on deep brain stimulation, you can compare his symptoms. And this is only uh, 10 minutes later. He has a, a significant improvement, a significant improvement in movement velocity. He is able to uh, move his limbs. He is spontaneously moving his face and his head. He has no issue and in, in no increased turning step amount, and he has a much improved gait. While, of course, there are some patients where the DBS effect is less obvious, all, all, most of the patients get a very significant improvement in also a documented randomized control, uh, controlled, validated uh, improvement in quality of life. So it's not only motor symptoms, but also the quality of life that improves. Now, here's a, a schematic again, where you can see how this works. There's a probe that is uh, implanted from the surface, through the surface of the brain into the subthalamic nucleus. And many people ask first, like, doesn't this damage the brain? And of course it does, but um, the size of this is only a millimeter. And there was no systematic effect that could be shown just from the implant. And it's something that has been routine, routinely done for biopsies or other, uh, uh, other important neurosurgical interventions where you get a burr hole and uh, you implant this lead into the depths of the brain. 
And the idea is not only that we are modulating here with the stimulation of the subdynamic nucleus, which has been identified as a, a, a key player in Parkinsonian uh, uh, pathophysiology, but we are probably modulating the entire circuit. So deep brain stimulation is a network therapy and it interferes with the entire motor network. Now, the basal ganglia are not only associated with motor features, but also with other networks, like uh, in addition to the motor network. Here it is shown for the um, motor cortex connectivity to striatum, GPE, GPI, STN, thalamus, and the loop back. But it's also, uh, the, this uh, similar circuit is also shown in a lightly uh, distinct um, anatomical space for associative cortical areas, but also for the limbic circuit. And the subdynamic nucleus uh, itself is part of at least two direct pathways or two pathways of inhibition. One is the hyperdirect pathway and one is the indirect pathway. And the hyperdirect pathway has been hypothesized to play a role in cognitive inhibitory control as part of an inhibition triangle between the subdynamic nucleus, the sub supplementary motor area, and the right inferior frontal gyrus. But it's also part of the classic basal ganglia route to the indirect pathway that is known to be overly active in Parkinson's disease due to the loss of D2 dopaminergic uh, uh, suppression of activity. So, we believe that the mechanism of action of the subdynamic TBS may be this inhibition in the motor network. And people, in it, we and other people have asked themselves, like, what is the role of the subdynamic nucleus? And does it also in, involve higher order cognitive functions or lower order uh, breaking? And there was a landmark paper by Michael Frank published in Science in 2007 where he could show that um, in a decision-making task about um, monetary decisions, deep brain stimulation can affect reaction times. And indeed, on stimulation, the reaction time pattern between decisions that were difficult and involved cognitive conflict, uh, the uh, reaction time was reduced while in a, another condition, with low conflict or easy decisions, the reaction time was not changed through DBS. Uh, when you compare this to normal or seniors, age-matched seniors, or uh, other DBS off conditions, there's really a reversal of quicker reactions to more difficult decisions. And we have formalized this in another behavioral behavioral uh, publication. Uh, this is a study by Nikos Green, uh, published with um, Andrea Kühnes, last author, my uh, mentor and head of the neuromodulation unit. And you can see again that here there's stimulus coherence on the x-axis, which kind of is an indirect measure of difficulty in decisions. And the slower the or, or the less the coherence of these stimuli, which was a moving dots paradigm, uh, was the stronger was the reaction time effect of DBS, which again means shows that if a difficult decision is to be made, DBS leads to more impulsive reactions. And this led to specific hypothesis that DBS interferes with physiological signaling beyond motor sign improvement. So uh, translated, this means that I would say that it's not only the symptoms that are changed through DBS, but also behavior. And uh, particularly, it seems that we can, we can create impulsive choices in patients by switching on the stimulation, whereas uh, off stimulation, such difficult decisions are similar to the decisions that normal uh, people would make. And on the other hand, that means that if we understand such effects in terms of their specific pathways, we may uh, use a novel stimulation paradigm that 
accounts for such side effects uh, to improve the therapy for the patients. And the uh, one research question that I, asked my, that I asked myself is whether it is possible for us to segregate specific pathways that we stimulate in Parkinson's disease patients. And therefore, I have designed a task that was kind of uh, uh, on the interface between cognition and a motor output. And I wanted to understand how deep brain stimulation can affect behavior, so uh, movement kinematics, movements, and symptoms, but on the other hand, cognitive control over movement. And therefore, this is a reach out task where patients were asked to move a pen on a cursor, uh, a cursor on the screen using a pen on a tablet. And in the easy or automatic condition, the pen to cursor mapping was normal. So if a cursor, uh, 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 if a target appeared on the upper right part of the screen, the patients had to move the pen to the upper right part of their tablet. There was a second condition where there was a controlled um, or, or con cognitive control was uh, important because the pen to cursor mapping was inverted. That means that uh, whenever a target appeared on the upper right of the screen, the patients had to move the pen to the lower left of the screen. And we did a behavioral experiment often on stimulation. And you can see the clinical symptom severity score called uh, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. This is a measure of the motor symptoms of the Parkinson's disease patients that dramatically improved in this cohort. So there were actually a lot of, uh, lot of clinical improvement. And when we look at the specifics of this task, we can identify a few very interesting mechanics that uh, the DBS induces. First of all, compared to healthy controls in yellow, in the easy condition, the reaction time was not significant, was significantly different um, across cohorts, but not within the stimulation uh, condition contrast. So deep brain stimulation did not lead to a reaction time effect if the movement that was to be produced was easy. On the other hand, in the controlled or more difficult condition where the pen to cursor mapping was inverted, there was a very uh, clear distinction between the off and on DBS state. And the reaction time in, in this more difficult condition in the on state resembled that of the healthy controls. Now, if we look at the difference between these two conditions for each group, you can see that in the off and on condition, the uh, reaction time difference was very similar and significantly longer than, than compared to the DBS on condition, which means that DBS, DBS led to a loss of inhibitory control in this, even compared to healthy subjects, in the pre preparation of difficult movements. Now, interestingly, if we look at another aspect of the behavior, movement velocity, we can see that there is a dramatic increase in movement speed regardless of the condition. And if we look at the difference between the two conditions again, you can see that healthy controls slow down their movements when the movement becomes more difficult, while Parkinson's disease off and on stimulation did not modulate the movement with relation to the difficulty of the task, which I believe shows us something about the system that is affected by DBS and shows us that Parkinson's disease patients have difficulty uh, adapting their movement velocity to the demand of the environment and that deep brain stimulation leads to an improvement in ve velocity but not to an improvement in adaptation to environmental demands and this has consequences because if we look at the vector error or the uh, the difference between the optim optimal movement and the performed movement DBS leads to more erroneous uh, behavior and leading to a specific increase in vector error or, or movement trajectory error that is independent of the velocity in terms of, um, or, or controlled for changes in velocity. It's not just they're moving faster and that's why there's more uh, uh, difference 
it's just objectively there's an uh, there's a more suboptimal movement performed in these patients and this led to a few hypotheses first one being that the hyperdynamic pathway may slow down responses to allow adaptive motor preparation under cognitive demand so in other words this means that there is a, a the, the role of the subdynamic nucleus and the cortical subdynamic fibers may be the the it buys you time to improve your behavior and stimulation of this of this pathway could lead to less time that you can take to prepare your movement and um, translating into more erroneous but faster movements another um, Another aspect that we believe uh, we may be able to show is that suppression of indirect pathways through stimulation leads to increased movement velocity and symptom alleviation. So basically, we try to dis dissect the cognitive effect and the motor effect of the stimulation um, with respect to specific pathways. And here you can see the next step um, in this study, which was identification of the exact anatomical uh, structure that we are modulating with the leads and here are all the uh, all the electrodes of the cohort projected to the m and i space to so a common standard space and the yellow structure is the subdynamic nucleus and now with the uh, clear and defined picture of where these electrodes lie we can um, ask how what is the relation to structural connectivity from these points where we stimulate? And this is the average point where we stimulate the dorsal lateral subdynamic nucleus, which overlies with the optimal stimulation target. And we can use such points or regions of interest now to um, do a connectomic approach to understanding the behavior by using structural fiber tracking connectomes and um, identifying the cortical subthalamic fibers that are affected through the stimulation. And this allows us to study the relation of specific connectivity profiles to the behavioral changes. And we did this in the entire cohort. Here's the uh, uh, example that I just showed. And this is the entire uh, connectivity profile that we identified for the cohort. Uh, there are mainly frontal subdynamic fibers that we affect with the stimulation. And we could show that the reaction time effect that we have observed, which um, is summarized as a loss of slowing of reaction time with respect or in the presence of cognitive demand was associated with the number of fibers that connect the supplementary motor area with this uh, with the subthalamic nucleus and we have replicated and validated this uh, in two uh, two analysis domains one being the absolute number of fibers that we're stimulating and the uh, other one being the relative amount of fibers from this pathway compared to fibers of other pathways. Now, uh, we believe that stimulating more fibers connecting the SMA to the STN that leads to shorter reaction times. And we have controlled for clinical symptom alleviation and we did not find a significant uh, correlation between clinical effect with, with the all movement kin kinematics, which suggests that there is a distinct cognitive DBS effect through stimulation of these fibers. Now, the issue is that the second pathway that I was talking about, the indirect pathway, is a subcortical one. And the subcortical pathways are much more difficult to understand or study with uh, neuroimaging, and especially with DTI, because structural connectivity is very prone to false positives and the smaller the, or int more intricate the uh, uh, interactions are on the subcortical level, the more difficult it becomes to identify meaningful fibers with DTI and neuroimaging. But we have helped ourselves in a different way, and this is a collaboration with, with Fred Hamka, who is a computational neuroscientist in um, Chemnitz. And he has a long history of developing spiking rate models of the basic ganglia. 
And here on the left side, you can see the uh, firing rate model of, of uh, which is capable to perform the task. It consists of four neurons in the supplementary motor area, then striatal neurons and subdynamic neuro neurons, each being capable of, uh, of computationally uh, uh, coding different aspects of the movement that is to be produced and we have kind of copied 20, this model of 20 times and adjusted parameters with respect to specific aspects of the patients. The, uh, the symptom severity modulates the dopaminergic uh, uh, activity in this model. The number of fibers that we stimulate modulates the uh, hyperdirect pathway modulation of the DBS um, simulation. And this leads uh, to a model where we can actually uh, observe what it is doing during the task. So here you can see the time point zero being the onset of the, of the uh, visual cue. And you can see the model starting at work from the SMA running activities through the whole cortical basal ganglia thalamic circuit. Uh, ending in the performance of the movement. Now we can use these models and introduce specific conditions uh, to understand what happens in which time point of the of the task and which lesions can replicate the behavior of PD patients on DBS. So we trained the model on the off state and the healthy controls and introduced changes into the model to try to replicate what happens during stimulation. And this has led to the observe, observation that lesioning the hyperdirect pathway, the SMA to SDN um, pathway neurons, leads to a, a predicted reaction time change that resembles that of the stimulation, while lesioning the indirect pathway can predict the change in movement time that seem to be distinct in terms of the, uh, of the DBS effect. Now, if we uh, take this all together, we can model DBS virtually and replicate the findings in behavior that we have um, caught with the task. And this in the future may help us to understand really what is going on in basic ganglia functionally and how potentially neural prosthetics may be programmed that identify pathological activity and modulates it in a way that can help patients move without or with fewer side effects than the chronically turned on continuous stimulation. So uh, this is the first part of my uh, lecture, and I would like to conclude that the subdynamic nucleus uh, stimulation differentially interferes with motor execution and perforation that is dependent on environmental requirements and leads to a loss of adaptive capacity in PTD patients. Cortical subdynamic hyperdirect pathway stimulation may lead to decreased reaction time adaptation independent from the clinical symptom alleviation. Now, we can also look in the motor domain, always look about, uh, think about motor learning and how the stimulation and Parkinson's disease may affect motor learning because dopaminergic, uh, dopamine is known or dopaminergic innovation is, has long been associated with reinforcement of behavior and therefore also with um, learning of movements and habits. And um, our task allowed us specifically to try to understand what the relationship is between the basal ganglia and the cerebellum in motor learning. And we know that most investigations of Parkinson's disease focused on the basal ganglia and the uh, cerebellum has often been overlooked. Looked. But a hallmark, a major paper in, published in, I think, 2010 in uh, PNAS recently reviewed 2018 in Nature Reviews Neuroscience, demonstrated for the first time that there's a disynaptic connection between the striatum in the basal ganglia and the cerebellum via a thalamic route. And there, it's, it's bidirectional, so there is actually communication between the cerebellum and the basal ganglia uh, in both directions. 
and we used our behave our task and our data to try to investigate the circuit that was associated with improvement in behavior over the course of the trials in this task and this was a second publication coming out of the sec of the same data set and this is Anna Marcelino who um, did the whole study with me as a doctoral student published this last year in brain and show could show that in off medication and uh, off stimulation state there is very little improvement of movement over over trials and this is the movement time so the ultimate uh, performance measure in this task how long does it take the patient to move the uh, cursor to the target and in yellow you can see the on stimulation condition and in red you can see the healthy controls now you can see that the the yellow um, on stimulation condition really resembled the uh, the improvement of the healthy controls and if we formalize this as the change between start and end of the um, task there's a significant improvement uh, and difference between the off stimulation condition and the on stimulation condition and also between on uh, off stimulation condition and healthy controls so this um, lets us first of all identify that Parkinson's disease patients have difficulty learning um, the task if the stimulation is switched on. Stimulation leads to significant improvement in motor learning. Now we could, again, use a connectomic approach to identify brain regions that are associated with uh, this improvement in learning. And this is a whole brain connectivity map that is uh, uh, kind of the profile associated with, with good learning. And um, the whole brain connectivity map could predict in task improvement. Again, uh, sorry, I have to maybe uh, explain again. Uh, this is the connectivity from the active DBS contacts that when they are switched on, which man network do they affect? And how does this relate to the improvement in motor learning? And the, the, this profile could predict motor learning. And if we took a region of interest approach, and uh, only used motor cortex and cerebellar connectivity, we could actually improve the prediction of uh, the behavior or the change in movement, motor learning uh, much better. And it turned out that the ipsilateral cerebellum was the best predictor for change of motor learning through DBS. So in other words, we believe that subthalamic stimulation needs to distributed effects in the cerebellum that can improve motor learning and interestingly the area that was most as, or, or the connectivity profile most associated with stimulation induced improvement in motor learning overlapped with the uh, exactly with the area where previously was shown um, is the connection between basic ganglia and cerebellum so try to try improvement in visual motor performance as a proxy of motor learning is impaired in Parkinson's disease. Subdynamic neuromodulation improves motor learning in PD patients and functional connectivity from active DBS contacts to, to the cruise one and two of the cerebellar hemisphere is the best predictor for DBS induced improvement, improvement in motor learning. So the next part of my lecture will be about clinical implications and um, clinical things uh, that we can learn from DBS we also with regard to electrophysiology but I want to make sure that uh, you can actually follow and have the opportunity to ask questions so I'm going to make a three minute break here and ask you uh, if first of all if everything is okay with the lecture second of all if you have any specific questions to the content that I've demonstrated so far Anyone still there? Thank you, it was very nice. Okay, great. So uh, you can still hear, hear me, right? <laughs> it's a little bit creepy. Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect, great. So I'll move on. And um, I want to uh, move on by showing that uh, we not only have the opportunity to look at behavior and clinical effects, 
but also uh, circuit dynamics uh, through recording of local field potentials uh, in combination, for example, with non-invasive electrophysiology like EEG and MEG. And actually we can we use this um, all at the same time and combining invasive neurophysiology with non-invasive EEG, MEG and symptoms and behavioral measures. And um, I want to point uh, to a uh, concept of disease specific rhythms that our, uh, or my mentor Andrea Kuhn um, has pioneered alongside her postdoctoral mentor Peter Brown, uh, who is a, a professor of experimental neurology in Oxford. And they showed that in the Parkinsonian off state, you can record activity in the basal ganglia through these DBS leads. And you can see that there's a specific pattern of activity, namely beta activity, that is increased when the patients did not take any medication. Well, in the dopaminergic on state, so after the patients take more dopaminergic medication, there's a decrease of this activity. And um, it, the whole pattern is distinct when compared to dystonia patients. Dystonia is another uh, movement disorder that can also be treated with deep, deep brain stimulation. It is associated with involuntary muscle contractions. So phenomenology, uh, the phenomenology is very different to, or at least distinct from Parkinson's disease. And this has led to the idea of ryth specific rhythms in the brain that uh, contribute to the symptoms and pathology of the uh, disease. And we have taken this further in the last 10 years and identified specific rhythms and patterns of activity in the subthalamic nucleus of these patients. Could show that in a large cohort of 63 patients, this activity pattern in the beta band uh, is correlated directly with the symptom severity. This does, this is a measure or a invasive biomarker of the symptom severity of the patients. And we can also look at this in a function, uh, uh, during a functioning. So this is movement evoked activity in the subdynamic nucleus. Time point zero on the X axis indicates the start of a rotational hand movement. And on the left side, you can see the on dopaminergic condition in small, medium and large movements. You can see that with increasing movement uh, uh, size and speed, there is an increase in gamma band activity in this high frequency range. And on the right side, this is a measure of significance. So you can see that uh, in the large condition, the gamma band activity um, at 60 to 80 Hertz is increased. And compared to the off medication condition, you can see uh, also that dopamine leads to an increase of gamma band oscillations induced by movements. Now we can also look at the activity during continuous movements. And this is an exemplary rotational hand movement task where the patients performed their movements or rota hand rotations over 30 seconds. And we can look at how this brain activity evolves during these uh, movement trials of 30 seconds. And it could be shown that even uh, during the continuous movements, beta band activity is present and reflects the uh, movement velocity over, uh, over the whole cohort of patients. So that means that slowness of movement or bradykinesia, which we have identified as one of the key hallmarks of Parkinson's disease, can be uh, measured through invasive recordings. And this could inform us about the patient's state and the uh, necessity for treatment. Now, uh, there's another symptom that I have briefly mentioned, which is tremor. And tremor is different to bradykinesia in terms of the electrophysiological signature. Tremor leads, is a, a kind of um, oscillatory activity of agonist and antagonist muscles leading to shaking of the hand. And in Parkinson's disease, this is uh, usually a resting tremor, meaning that tremor is, is present at rest, rest and not during um, performance of voluntary movements. 
and in the uh, local field potential, so the invasive recordings, but also on the cortical level with non-invasive magnetoencephalography, it was shown that when tremor emerges here in the EMG, uh, the tremor specific activity increases in the low frequency uh, band. And this means that other compared to bradykinesia, the electrophysiological signature or uh, correlate of symptom severity during tremor is in a different frequency band. And this is a nice machine learning study published in Düsseldorf by Jan Hirschmann um, where he used a hidden Markov model to predict the presence of tremor, which could be helpful in a clinical setting because it could allow us to um, adapt the stimulation and turn it off and on only when required. The issue though is that Parkinson's disease patients have both bradykinesia and tremor. And with these distinct markers, it may be very difficult to create a, a, a clinical brain computer interface that is allows to um, identify different measures at the same time if the electrophysiological signature, signatures influence each other. Um, now, Parkinson's disease is not the only disease that we can study. I've mentioned this before, and this is a, a paper that we published in 2015 where we looked at the oscillatory connectivity. So this is again a whole brain circuit connectivity measure in this time, this time uh, physiological measure uh, as coherence where we could, so this is coherence of phase and amplitude of oscillations between the internal pallidum, part of the basal ganglia and the entire cortex. And we could identify that connectivity of, and functional connectivity is present in distinct frequency bands with distinct spatial relations. In the alpha frequency band, we found the co uh, connections to the cerebellum, while in the beta frequency band, we found connections between the basic ganglia and the motor cortex or sensory motor uh, uh, regions. And uh, this points also to the, it's not only to distinct uh, spatial temporal uh, patterns in connectivity of oscillations, but also to disease specific uh, uh, biomarkers that can again be used to improve the therapy of patients with the different aspects or different uh, disorders that are treated with stimulation. And on the right side, this is a similar study as presented for Parkinson's disease before, but this time for dystonia patients. And we could show that not beta activity, but low frequency of theta oscillations uh, predict the symptom severity or uh, are associated with stronger symptom severity um, in these patients. And I think this is a nice aspect in this paper where we utilize the spatial uh, imaging component to image this, the amplitude of oscillations in 3D in the human uh, brain and uh, identified a peak, a spatial peak of theta activity in the basic ganglia and could show that this peak overlaps with the optimal stimulation target for the patient, which again supports the idea that subdynamic neurom or uh, not subdynamic, but in this case, deep brain stimulation um, may act through modulation of oscillatory rhythms. And we have identified other disease uh, specific aspects of basic ganglia activity and Tourette syndrome, OCD, and depression. And this in depression, this was from uh, limbic targets, so not basic ganglia in this, in this case, but uh, the cingulate cortex where we could record activity in uh, first clinical trial on improving very severely affected patients with uh, deep brain stimulation. And we could identify alpha band oscillations that are present in de depressed, but not in OCD patients. And again, reflected the this depressive symptoms. Now we have, uh, if we want to use the, but these electrophysiological uh, signatures of, of disease specific aspects, we need to be able to record it continuously. And we have performed pioneering work with uh, uh, the first devices that can record activity while implanted into the uh, uh, like completely under the skin with, with 
devices that allow recording of activity for the first time. And here you can see an exemplar trace of, uh, of the activity recorded in a PD patient uh, at baseline. So after directly after the implant, three months after the implant and eight months after the implant. And um, here you can see the spectral signature of dopaminergic medication and on dopaminergic medication. And you can see that even over months, this spectral signature with increased beta band activity in the dopaminergic off state replicates very well. And the suppression through medication and modulation is uh, stable through our over months of stimulation and recording. And we have recently used this, uh, the similar method also in dystonia where we could show that the low frequency peak in the theta frequency band uh, is actually predictive of the current symptom severity, which in this case is a, a dystonia rating scale score, um, even months after stimulation. Now, I have introduced electrophysiological biomarkers for specific behavior and symptoms, for example, um, tremor in the low frequency band, but also in the low frequency band, we saw that dystonia is uh, reflected in the basal ganglia activity in Tourette syndrome. We found ticks to be associated with low frequency oscillations, while dopaminergic withdrawal, body kinesia, and rigidity are associated with beta band activity. And um, this is a review that I wrote in 2019, which kind of demonstrates that there is a multitude of measures that have been described to reflect specific aspects of diseases. And this is getting more and more complex. And, but it may be useful for adapting the stimulation to concurrent demand. And this is a major hallmark paper in uh, adaptive deep brain on adaptive deep brain stimulation in advanced Parkinson's disease, published by Peter Brown in 2013. And he uh, described for the first time uh, a device that records the, stim records the activity, uh, but is also capable of stimulating with re uh, respect or adapted by the electrophysiology that is recorded. And I have shown before that beta band activity was associated with Parkinson's disease. And the way they used this was a very simple threshold that you can see here on the right side. Um, whenever beta band activity shown in this graph increases over or crosses a certain threshold in the amplitude, the stimulation is switched on. While when the uh, stimulation or the stimulation suppressed beta band activity and it falls below this threshold, the stimulation is turned off. And th this is the first uh, clinical study that has shown that adapting stimulation to electrophysiology is, um, is uh, feasible and uh, it can robustly and uh, uh, significantly improve symptoms, even when compared to a stimulation paradigm when the, whereas DBS is continuously turned on. So here you can see uh, the condition where there's no DBS, adaptive DBS, meaning stimulation turned on in dependence of the presence of beta band activity, continuous DBS, meaning that stimulation is always turned on, and random DBS. And random DBS means that stimulation is turned on during random time points. And when compared to random, adaptive DBS and continuously DB, continuous DBS suppress beta band activity or beta band power, but also improved the UPDRS hemibody score, which is the motor symptom severity score in these patients. Now, this has led to a manufacturer developing uh, the uh, new device that is implantable that can record LFP activity directly from the leads. This is the Medtronic Percept PC. It has been um, released this year, and actually our center was the first center in the world that has implanted one of these uh, in IPGs, and it allows it allow, allows to identify peaks of activity and uh, patterns of, of increased synchrony in the local feed potentials recorded when the whole system, uh, whole device is implanted. 
now previous generations of such a device and also this device is probably not perfect and there are uh, still issues with artifacts especially during simulation but uh, nevertheless this is a, a major milestone for implantable clinical brain computer interfaces that have a direct uh, potential to improve the uh, uh, therapy in a wide, very wide scope of, uh, of PD patients. So more than 100,000 patients have received deep brain stimulation as a therapy for Parkinson's disease. And um, this is a milestone where in the future we may treat more than 100,000 patients with an implantable clinical brain computer interface that reads the local field potentials and adapt stimulation to the demand uh, of the patient. Now, local field potentials and the deep structures aren't the only uh, measures of electrophysiological changes in Parkinson's disease. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cortical uh, side of, of disease specific aspects of activity. And, uh, Philip Starr is a neurosurgeon at UCSF in California, and he has pioneered the use of invasive cortical measures during deep brain stimulation um, implants. He's a neurosurgeon, and during this, while he uh, implanted the DBS leads, he additionally put an ECOG strip on the cortex of the patient subdurally and recorded activity from there. And he demonstrated that before stimulation, there's very strong cross-frequency coupling. And um, on the x-axis here, you can see the frequency of the phase or carrier frequency. And um, on the y-axis, you can see frequency for the amplitude. And this graph shows that around 20 hertz, there is an interaction between, uh, uh, between activity uh, or the phase of the beta band signal and the amplitude of the high frequency activity. Uh, it's a little bit similar like uh, to uh, may maybe sharp wave ripples, if people are uh, familiar with that. It means that in a specific phase of the beta band, there's an increase in high frequency oscillations and stimulation leads to a loss or a decrease in this, uh, of this phenomenon, which rebounds after stimulation is turned on. So this means that Parkinson's disease leads to increased phase amplitude coupling, beta and high gamma coupling, which is alleviated by DBS and gives us another biomarker that could be used. So electrocorticography or ECOG has, especially by Phil Starr in California, been suggested to be another way to use a clinical brain computer interface to adjust stimulation to specific aspects of the disease and also to presence of side effects by evaluating phase amplitude coupling, but also high gamma band oscillations that are present during stimulation and can be uh, used as a biomarker to adjust, adjust the simulation parameters. Now, I think that you will all agree that this is really complex and there are different measures, even in different brain regions that can be recorded and how are we ever going to get the right approach to this. And, um, recently, we have proposed that maybe um, we can use machine learning to understand when a patient needs a specific stimulation parameter change. And um, by kind of combining all the insight that we have gained and reviewed in this publication into uh, uh, different models, we may be able to more comprehensively uh, understand what is going on and required. And we have uh, uh, successfully uh, 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 applied for a collaborative research grant with Mark Richardson, he's the Director of Functional Neurosurgery at MG MGH Harvard University, and uh, machine learning pioneer Tom Mitchell, Benjamin Blankertz, in, uh, who you probably all know, and Andrea Kuhn are all in this project, and we are looking at deep neural network approaches and other machine learning algorithms to improve closed loop deep brain stimulation using a combination of electrocorticography and LFP, trying to um, identify electrophysiological signatures and predict their presence to improve the therapy of these patients. And here's a, a mark performing the surgery uh, on a patient 
and you can see how he places the ecox script through the burr hole into uh, uh, to the under the dura into the skin and you can see that actually this uh, is a procedure that takes like 30 minutes and that's why i like to show this it's uh, uh, it gives us a unique opportunity to understand brain activity from the cortex and also allows to adapt stimulation based on signals that can be recorded from the cortex and this is uh, the this is the kind of schematic uh, how it works the dbs seed is implanted into the depths here we have these DBS contexts through which we, we, can, we can record, for example, subdynamic activity in Parkinson's disease. This is a coronal slice. And here is the motor cortex, and we can record um, ECOG through uh, such a, a strip from sensory motor brain regions. And we have used this, and Mark Richardson has really uh, uh, used this since a long time in a recent publication in the Journal of Neuroscience. We could show that. Uh, the cortical activity and high gamma band activities, particularly during speech productions, allows us to decode specific aspects of, of, uh, of the vocalization. Um, and we could identify locations of or spatial spectral patterns of tongue related vowels versus lip related uh, speech. And this gives us a very fine grained uh, opportunity to identify electrophysiological patterns with relation to behavior that is impossible to reach from the subthalamic region where we did not, uh, we, where we could not uh, differentiate these uh, very specific aspects of speech production. Now, we have recently uh, uh, moved to a framework where we want to understand whether it is possible to use real-time decoding to, uh, of the present of movement um, using LFP and ECOG recordings and we wanted to uh, this is the first pioneering study in our grant proposal where we want to show that we can use these recordings across patients without retraining to predict that the patient is moving and we believe that uh, if we can stimulate or adapt the stimulation to this specific time point we may be able to uh, support the, the movements of the patients and uh, reduce side effects by not stimulating when the patient doesn't want to move and he doesn't require maybe the stimulation at that time. And this is uh, a kind of archival da data set from Mark's group uh, where he has recorded ECOG intraoperatively alongside uh, force pressing. So the patients were pressing a force lever in the operation room and ECOG and LFP signatures were recorded. And Timon Merck uh, has yesterday uh, uh, defended his master's thesis, and he did all the work in, in this study where he uh, developed a, an approach of machine learning and predicting force, force uh, amplitude from ECOG and LFP signals from the subdynamic nucleus. And here you can see the performance of a random forest classifier um, uh, identifying the presence of movement from cortical versus SCN signatures. Now the difficulty is in, in this task to trying to identify uh, or, or uh, train a model that performs across patients is that each of these strip locations from different locations or from different patients are uh, in different locations and that means that you never have the exact same activity pattern because uh, each uh, uh, implant trajectory is different and we have uh, created an approach where with spatial interpolation of the individual locations to common grid points and we could show that this approach is uh, performing similarly well what, compared to using the original raw channels and this is shown here for contralateral movements this is the performance measure or the area under the curve of the classifier and um, you can see that if we re record brain activity from the opposite side of them where the movement was performed, the uh, classification is much better compared to the ipsilateral side. But uh, also importantly, we can see that ECOG, electrocorticography, performed much better when compared to subdynamic local feed potentials. 
And the most right part here is the leave one patient out approach where um, we could show that even if we only train on patients that are not, uh, that, that are, uh, even if we test our models on, on, uh, on single patients that were left out in the training, um, we can achieve uh, AUC uh, measures on average above 0 0.8, which is really not the case for the subdynamic LFPs. So here we compared different, um, or Timon compared different machine learning arch architectures, and he could show that random forest and neural networks perform best, and that the contralateral ECOG signal was performing uh, the best, or was the best signature of movement for decoding the presence. And we had recently, we have just started doing ECOG uh, during DBS, uh, operations and we can identify connectivity measures and specific aspects of the of the activity with relation to movement and it also gave us the opportunity to test Timon's models on uh, decoding of movement in an entirely new patient recorded in a different center with different hardware so the model was trained on Mark's data from uh, from the US 16 PD patients in the operation room and was tested here and validated on the patient from Berlin and we could reach a, a performance of 0 0.92 with pass positive rate of 0 0.12 and you can see the single uh, trials where true movement is blue and uh, prediction is red and you can see how well our model could predict the, the uh, movement amplitude and the presence of movement across patients. I think this is a really a big step and a milestone for us because it means that yes we can use ECOG to uh, create a brain computer interface that does not require retraining to adapt stimulation and ultimately our goal is to uh, develop a uh, high precision personalized adaptive DBS using machine learning and the input features here are specific band frequency uh, filtered signals with signatures of high gamma, low gamma, uh, high beta, low beta activity and uh, leading to the decoding of different aspects of this of the, the disease that we want to study. For example, dysarthria is the difficulty in speaking, freezing is stopping during walking and walking could also benefit from, from adapting stimulation parameters. Dyskinesia is the presence of involuntary uh, hyperkinetic movements that are associated with overstimulation or uh, uh, as a side effect of dopaminergic agents. Tremor is a symptom that we have talked about before, and bradykinesia is the slowness of movement. We believe that we can extend our framework that we have just introduced to uh, decoding specific symptoms and aspects and um, thereby inform an adaptive control mechanism that can shape the pulses that we, uh, uh, that we trigger with the stimula stimulator. And, um, Lead that, that could lead to clinically defined optimal symptom specific DBS parameters and a better quality of life for the patients. Now, this can only not only used, be used to uh, improve the therapy, but also to use uh, or provide insight into uh, cognitive domains or uh, specific ideas about brain communication and this is a study that we're going to start uh, next year where we use the brain BCI approach to predict whether or not a patient is going to or has the intention to move and use the stop signal that, to interfere with this. This is based, uh, this is a collaboration with John Haynes and he has published the study in 2016 with uh, Matthias Schulze-Kraft as the first author using EEG. And now we can replicate this with ECOG, and you can see during movement, there's gamma band synchronization. Um, prior to movement, there's beta band oscillations, and the green band indicates our decoding. And this decoder can induce a stop signal, which asks the patient to stop all his uh, behavior. And then we can understand how the cortex and the subcortex communicate 
to uh, stop any ongoing uh, motor intention. I'm really looking forward to this study because I think it will give us a lot of insight about the functional role of the subnamic nucleus and how we can use machine learning to understand brain activity and uh, specific aspects. Now, having talked a lot about oscillations and brain patterns um, uh, in a very general manner, Further recent research has identified uh, specific aspects that are even more fine-grained than what I have uh, demonstrated and showed that beta oscillations that are associated with Parkinson's disease are um, non-sinusoidal in the cortex and they have a specific shape. And here are some exemplar, um, exemplar traces on the right, uh, where you can see this like sharp sawtooth-like uh, pattern of activity that re really looks like the characteristic beta band oscillations that we see. Now they are not clearly not a sinusoidal oscillation, but they are kind of a discharge into one direction and then uh, a back, going back to baseline. This can be studied uh, using computational methods and all the code for this is available from Scott Cole and Bradley Wojtek who have uh, uh, pioneered these kinds of analysis based on the data of Philip Starr who I've mentioned before. He has published the phase amplitude coupling stuff and basically they could show that phase amplitude coupling may not so be important but more the waveform shape uh, may reflect a measure of uh, of phase amplitude coupling because whenever there is a non-sinusoidal shape there is a higher probability of high frequency activity landing in in this longer phase when compared to this very fast discharge and they could show that dbs kind of smoothens out these uh, this sharpness and now we of course took the opportunity to also look at our data from the Berlin patient and uh, see what, what the exact physiological uh, patterns look like that we can record from there. And here you can see the raw data trace of the motor cortex and uh, you can see these very sharp discharges. And when we look at this in terms of like the standard power measures or uh, power spectrum, you can see that there's a there are three peaks in the theta range, in the six hertz range, in the alpha band range, in 12 hertz, but also in the beta band range, uh, 22 hertz. And zooming in, you can see these super sharp discharges that probably tell us something about the underlying thalamocortical computations that lead to these discharges, or at least uh, should tell us about the microcircuit that uh, generates these discharges and may be uh, pathologically altered in Parkinson's disease. And if we use a regular filtering approach, it is, becomes quite clear that neither beta nor alpha nor theta really optimally reflects this, uh, the frequency of these discharges. And um, that this may be something that we can study in the future to inform brain computer interfaces of the pathological state of uh, Parkinsonian patients. Interestingly, we could also uh, look at the sharpness and the sharpness ratio. Uh, the sharpness ratio is how sharp this trough of the signal is compared to this peak of the signal. And you, from the surf, first uh, picture of it, you can, uh, you can clearly see that the uh, negative side of the voltage is much sharper than the positive side. And the sharpness ratio uh, says uh, or gives us a measure that demonstrates asymmetry in sharpness between the positive and the negative deflection. And uh, here you can see the ECOG contact six, which is this yellow spot here, has a very strong increase in sharpness uh, compared to the other channels. And particularly the sharpness ratio is really very much increased in this Parkinsonian patient, which shows us that it is a measure that is specific to the motor circuit and um, pathologically altered in Parkinson's disease. And M1 here is motor cortex, S1 here is sensory cortex, P1, 2, 3 are contacts over the parietal lobe. 
and you can see that beta band activity is mainly present in the motor cortex where also this sharpness ratio is increased. Now, we could use such measures as uh, 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 beta band oscillations, gamma band oscillations, and oscillatory activity, but we can also use the very cycle by cycle nature of the physiological discharges to create a neural interface that mon monitors changes or pathological alterations and modulates the brain activity at the depths of the brain and potentially create a more healthy activity that can also improve the symptoms of the Parkinsonian patients. So the idea here is that in the far future, we may be able to, to produce a, a, a microchip that can be implanted and corrects pathologically altered activity in neurological disease. And I think with deep brain stimulation and electrocorticography in combination, we have a very unique methodology that is already established um, to pioneer these aspects and pioneer neural interfaces to uh, improve the quality of life of patients with movement disorders. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I think uh, the time is, timing is okay. We still have 50 minutes of uh, discussion in case someone is interested in specific aspects of the work. We can go back through the slides and discuss. And uh, I'm going to conclude here to, with the invitation to come work with us. We're always looking for PhD and master students. And just contact me if you're interested in lab rotation and we can figure something out. Of course, currently we are in the uh, middle of a pandemic, so we're not doing any experiments, but there are tons of data that we, uh, are, we have already recorded and also open data repositories that I work with. So uh, a lab rotation is uh, currently uh, very realistic to do, even with, uh, from home office and working with uh, data that are already acquired. So this uh, concludes my talk. Please let me know if you have any questions or any uh, comments to both the lecture itself and the content and research or questions regarding potential uh, work with me. Thank you. Okay, Jess uh, is, has a question. I'm going to try to unmute her. Needs also had a question. Okay. Um, hello, and thank you for the talk. It was a very yeah. nice talk. Um, I just wanted to know that um, in the middle of the presentation somewhere, you were mentioning the frequency analysis, but the data you were showing was kind of more like a functional um, magnetic resonance, like a fMRI. So do, did you also do frequency analysis on the fMRI data? Um, no, so I, I, yeah, so I didn't make a good uh, a bridge between the neuroimaging part and the um, electrophysiology part. So I was, in, in the beginning I was talking about neuroimaging and um, that was kind of to introduce the, the consequences of deep brain stimulation. And we had, this was studying the effects of DBS on specific pathways. We did not use a time frequency decomposition of fMRI. We, uh, we just used it to map specific um, consequences of the stimulation to specific brain areas. And um, the idea why this could be helpful for the later electrophysiology work is that we can use this to identify specific areas of the brain that might be, may be important to monitor with electrophysiology. And we may uh, be able to um, use the understanding of pathway-specific effects of DBS to shape the stimulation that we want to uh, uh, get out by using pathway specific electrophysiology measures. So yeah, you're making a great point. I didn't really uh, show how exactly the neuroimaging would aid this, but uh, generally I think it gives us an idea what we can study and how we can uh, use the, the combination of brain function and topography to improve uh, stimulation with electrophysiology. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
So Nicolas also raised his, raised his hand. Nico, are you there? Uh, yes, hi. hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation, it was uh, very interesting. I have three questions, but I would like to start with the first part of your presentation. Yeah. At some point you showed that the effects of the uh, deep brain stimulation between on and off with uh, respect to the control group, which was the health group. Yeah. And you showed that there is, um, a, there is a lower um, tremor, but there is a higher error yeah. at the movement. Yeah, it's lower. Um, so I'm going to go back to the specific side. Yes, exactly. Uh, at this point, I I was thinking that it might be that you have the higher error uh, due to the fact that the patient with um, with Parkinson's disease they have a forward model. That, that's what we were taught from control theory that the forward model inside the brain is what regulates movement. So sudden changes like removing that tremor is going to increase the error of the output. But this might be also uh, something that is. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, I, I, so I think generally I agree with you that the forward model uh, is very likely uh, affected by the stimulation. I did not talk about tremor in this case um, because uh, I didn't mention this and so you couldn't know it. But this was, uh, we excluded patients with tremor because it could affect the results and it would be something that it would be very difficult. So Parkinson's disease, as I said before, is always associated with slowness of movement and body kinesia but um, only some of the patients have tremor. And we only studied patients who do not have tremor so that the tremor doesn't interfere with the uh, kinematics. No, oh, but th doesn't it interfere with the velocity of the movement because you, th this is the middle one? Yeah, Parkinson's disease you, you, definitely you, interferes with velocity of movement, but not tremor. So tremor okay, here is I, not I, an I issue in this study. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but I'm still, you, in, in, sorry. Yeah, you're making a great point. I think that um, it definitely is a, a, a I think m my perspective on this is that the subdynamic nucleus is inhibitory in nature and may buy the cortex time to create a forward model. And if we uh, decrease this time through, through turning off the, the subdynamic nucleus, the forward model may be less optimally shaped before movement is executed. And also from control theory, we knew that if you increase or decrease the delays, that might lead to an unstable system. So in this case, as you can see that you increase the movement velocity and the reaction time gets shorter, then yeah. this also might be a reason that the patients cannot compensate for that delay. And that's why the, the error is increasing. Yeah. But actually, this brings me to the second question, because you talked about motor learning. Yeah. Uh, have you studied the, the effects, uh, the effect of the change, if it's permanent or not? is permanent or not we didn't it, this is a uh, short term where it's actually in the title even that it's short term uh, improvement so we we just we just had the opportunity to look at it uh, over the course of the trials we did not study it uh, in the long term because so i was still considering the changes in the um, in the forward model so if someone trains a little bit with uh, dbs and the subthalamic mirror modulation then the forward model might adapt adapt to that. So then you would expect them to react a little bit differently when the modulation is back off. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that would be super interesting to study in the future. And my final question is about the alpha, beta, and theta uh, bands that you showed in the last part of your lecture. Yeah. Uh, you showed that there were, there is a very little um, correlation between those bands and the the peaks in the signal. Yeah, so you're talking about the association of a filtered signal and uh, discharges. This. Is that yes, right? exactly that point. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to uh, include the machine learning, to train actually a machine learning or a deep learning network to test for different linear combinations between the signals of the beta, alpha, and theta 
Oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's actually what Timon has already done. So um, we, the, this movement decoding approach that we have studied here, and this is the performance, was based on a, tr on a multivariate model that uh, included all frequency bands, uh, so distinct frequency bands as depicted here. So um, theta, alpha, uh, beta, and gamma. But not only that, but additionally, also it took into account uh, more than one time step. So it took kind of the history, the combination of history of uh, all these frequency bands together into account to decode movement. And the addition that I would like to uh, introduce in the future is that it should not only take these frequency bands into account, but also the specific aspects of the discharge from on a cycle by cycle basis. So the sharpness, for example, and the presence of such high amplitude discharges could be also inform a machine learning model. Yes, there was also in one of the papers that the shape of the discharge also uh, is, is a, could be potentially a biomarker of the, of the disease. Exactly. All right, thank great. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Anyone else? I saw Niels before raising his hands. Okay, if there are no more questions, Lisa, do you have any uh, housekeeping for the... I think there was another question from Safa, or at least Safa had waved. Yeah. Ah, okay. Safa, do you... Uh, no, I was just clapping. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. So then I will follow Safa's lead and thank you for this really great and interesting talk. I actually think it's one of the most, um, one of the highest numbers of participants I've ever seen at a BCCN <laughs> lecture. So thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and yeah, I hope that yeah. it was too awkward for you. No, it's fine. I mean, uh, we, we all have to get used to this, right? Uh, <laughs> so if anyone is interested in uh, uh, or has open questions that you want to discuss, I'm always open. Uh, I'm currently, I'm also working clinically, so some from time to time I'm re really busy in clinical work, but right now I'm uh, off for research, so I do have some time for discussion and also especially uh, regarding potential lab protections, master thesis or PhD uh, projects. Okay, then I will say goodbye and thank you all for joining and Thanks have again. a good day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> peace. Bye. Bye.